Time is running out to identify the first of three wines to win the $155 million inheritance. And to pull it off, this genre-bending show has the characters perform an aroma heist to confirm a wild theory. You heard me right. They have to steal a smell. Can Camille get away with this, and will she get one step closer to victory? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Road Goes Ever On and On, where we are breaking down the exciting wine-based show Drops of God every week. Today, we are looking at the third episode entitled Duel. And if you enjoy our content, there's no need to set up your own aroma heist. Just be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for notifications. If you haven't seen this episode, spoilers ahead. And with that being said, Mark, I'm sure you feel like I do. I want to talk about this aroma heist. Oh my god, it was so good! So good! I was sitting there, you know, this show has been very drama-based, and sitting there when they're basically doing the prep for the heist. You know, you we see a ton, like, in movies where they, like, sit down and they're like, all right, Jimmy's gonna go around back, we're gonna get the wheel guy up front, and we're gonna do this, this, and this. They set up the whole heist of, like, this is how you're going to do it. Like, this is how you're going to serve this wine. And so good. S like, that that first initial part also gave us information that she has been very well trained. She learned how to do that at eight years old. At eight? That's wild. I know. It, it, was, it was so <clears throat> good because it, it did a, a bunch of things right. So it was doing a heist in a wine movie or you know, wine show, which just... Seems like it should feel out of place, but it was absolutely fantastic. It made it so exciting and elevated what was going on. While they were doing this perfect heist, they were also doing a perfect wine presentation at a high speed. It was really impressive. You know, oh, yeah. the, the speed with which both one of the characters was opening the bottle and the speed with which the other character was describing what was going on. This could have so easily been a dry and boring scene, but instead, there's that heist music. There's that right. whole heist feel. It's it's high speed. It's got great energy. It it was absolutely beautiful. And even going past that, when they they actually execute the heist, the 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 tensions for me were so high. I was thinking that in a heist, something always goes wrong. Right. So I was waiting for her to spill on the customer or you know do something. That's just like a oh no how do they so it was it was really great how they were able to set everything up so brilliantly and just make it so exciting and then pay off and have this amazing tension as it's happening and it's such mundane material they're teaching her to open a bottle of wine and then she has to do wine service to a client right that it was so crazy the way that it built tension throughout the whole thing you know from the moment when she walks out to him you know presents the wine you see that luca's right in the back ready to you know he's touching tables ready to come in while she just smells it and then you see that the partner like leaves a piece a little bit of wine and you're like yes she can taste a little yes. bit so she can you know not just smell it she can get a little taste in and then he even Luca makes the comment about the wine. He's like, oh, how did you enjoy the wine? And he like, oh, I got to go back and finish it. And he finishes it. Oh. And the crazy part is it's not even the correct wine. They pull up this elaborate heist where they basically have to, you know, bring the bottle from a different restaurant. It's $12,000 bottle. They have to basically get a guy to buy it. And it's not even the right bottle. Right. Which even that felt like some heist ones not the the one where they're breaking into a bank vault but maybe when they're trying to find like a, a diamond in somebody's house and it turns out that their first attempt isn't the the right location you know so it's not in the safe that they thought it was and they have to come up with a plan b because it's in you know the person's summer house or something like that so it, it still kind of felt like they they had to come up with that next plan of you know what the, the group is down on their luck just like when a first heist has failed and, and they have to start thinking about uh, a plan B and it's like, can they even accomplish it in the amount of time? You know, it, it really was, I, this, this is such an exciting show, which is crazy when you think about what the, the topic is. And I love wine. I'm right. not saying anything wrong about wine, but it's, it's not generally something that is 
thrilling right like this right you know what else this show does right so when you watch a show right do you usually have your protagonist that you're rooting for and they're usually going up against the antagonist who you're usually rooting to lose and i feel like the thing that they have done so well in this show is they've set up camille as this protagonist where you're kind of following her more often so you want her to win but then you see that Issei is just as deserving like it, it has it puts these two characters up against each other that are likable that are relatable and so it, it's hard to figure out like who do you want to win in this duel honestly i i don't know i mean you know camille has been slighted in that she she lost all of this time with her dad because it turns out that you know her mom made a choice that can't be undone and now all of this time is is gone and then on top of that her dad has set up this elaborate test in order to get that inheritance so it's it's hard not to root for her but there's part of me that really roots for Issei because Camille has a pretty big support group. You know, she's got Luca in her corner, Philippe, Thomas, Misayabi, and Lorenzo. All of these people that are, at, at times, she's at times she's falling asleep and they're continuing work. Right. You know, or she needs help and they're flying out to her. So she's got this huge support staff, but then, or a support group. But then you have Issei, who is is doing all of this on his own without the support of the most basic of support, like the support of his family. Right. I, I do still think that we might see his friend and maybe significant other or a person he's interested in because we did see another note from this person right. in this episode. So it does kind of seem like they're continuing to set this person up. Right. We'll see about that. But yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really well done in the fact that poor Issei, he is, you know, basically has this relationship with his father, the one person that believes in him. And he he tries to, you know, follow his wife's lead and talk to Issei and have him reject the contest. So, like, there there's people actively against Issei, you know? Like, Camille has this huge support group to win, and Issei is actively being worked against. My question for you is, with this whole dual part, it, we saw that Issei won this test versus her not winning this test. So, I guess that would mean that if there's three tests, it, you have to win two out of three. So, we either need to see Camille win the next two, and we have to see Issei lose one, and then there could be a tie. I wonder if there is, like, a contingency if there is a tie. That's interesting. You know, I was kind of thinking that maybe the next one is a tie... That way Issei can kind of see what he's going against. And then the last one, who knows? Because I, I once again, I don't know who I want to win in this. It's it's wild. I Yeah. So well done. So there there is one thing actually talking about the the duel that I, I do want to kind of point out, and this goes back to something I was talking about before. And and this has to do with kind of like how they represent vintage in this. They make vintage seem like it's a sliding scale where, you know, this all you have to do is think about how a wine changes over time. And that's how you'll be able to tell if it is, you know, 14 or 15 years old. It's, it's like, is it this much older or or just like a little bit less than that? And And once again, this kind of goes back to that puzzle thing I was talking about where you wouldn't be looking at individual characteristics like the color and then making a determination like a direct determination about the vintage that would just be one of a bunch of clues but what one of the big things that you get to do with wine is that 
vintages are different. So it's not just how old does this wine seem? It's also your knowledge of once you think you found out, you know, in this case, they both think it's Chateau Cheval Blanc. And, and they're, she's thinking between 1999 and 2000. And so it's not which one seems one year older or one year younger. Like, what is it? Instead, you then go to, and this is really tough, and this is why you have to do so much studying to get into the wine world, is you have to know what each vintage was like. Because vintages can have marked differences between them. And so maybe one vintage is wildly better than the other. And so just off of that alone, you can see off the quality, there's no way that this could be a 99, you know, because of the the, the quality. So it's not just like, oh, it's basically the same wine, but it's like a year older. No, they're 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 markedly different. So because what so what you're saying is like the when they first thought that one wine that they needed to taste it had a certain vintage that they thought it was. I think it was the 86 or something. And then Correct, yeah. when they, the one that they got for the heist, wasn't that one a different vintage? And so then she tasted that one and was just like, no, right off the bat. So basically she wouldn't have been able to know that from the different vintages. I, I think that, that in, in that case, what they're basically saying is that, she she tasted the wine and it even though it wasn't the right vintage overall she could tell that it didn't have the right characteristics but honestly once again it would be, it would be more useful to see a, a few of them because they could be pretty different from vintage to vintage you would kind of need to understand what the baseline is taste a few of them and then have an understanding of okay well this is what this is regardless of vintage. And then here are the things that I'm seeing that this very wet year did versus this very sunny year or this year where we had late frost that actually killed a bunch of the buds. So we ended up with less fruit, which actually had the positive effect of concentrating the flavors among that smaller kind of fruit set. Interesting. So... They, I think she could still kind of figure out like, yeah, this, it's definitely not this wine, but also I don't think that it really is close enough to this to be just a different vintage of it. So I, I still think they could have done that. So like at the end when she actually does the duel and she, you know, she writes 1999 down first and they even tell her like, you're on your own for vintage. We really don't know. We really can't help you. So she's just and like taking a stab in the dark, but it, it does lead me to believe that this is all training that she has had before, that she is able to get back from when she was first um, training with Alexander. Right. So, but yeah, to, so to that end, they, they could have helped her by coming up with, you know, a comprehensive guide of if they've got it between these two wines and they have it within a vintage range because the flavor she's describing would show a certain kind of range of age, they should then give her descriptions of what is the Unico like during these vintages and what is the Chateau Cheval Blanc like during these vintages and what were the differences in the vintages. That way you can kind of then go through and, you know, if you have that, that wine that's just like, so amazing and so powerful because it was such a great vintage versus, you know, they tell you that this other vintage is kind of a poorer vintage because there's rain at harvest. And so the grapes just kind of swelled up with water, which basically dilutes all of the, the, the flavor and everything else kind of inside. Got it. So, so, so you can't just look to the right and think, oh, it's 2000, not 1999. Right. Because, because once again, like, it's not a sliding scale. It's not just, right. you know, like, this is one year older. It's The, the vintages are very different. So, it, especially in places like Europe, where there is a big difference in the weather. Here in California, that's where I am. We don't have huge vintage variation. We do have vintage variation, but we don't have huge vintage variation. Because we've got kind of temperate weather. Right. 
all throughout the year. So we're not, you know, having these super rainy years during harvest and super dry years. And it's, it's just kind of temperate for us and, and, and beautiful and, and feel free to move here if you like. I want to talk about the sound design in this episode. I thought that, you know, the last episode, I didn't really notice a big emphasis on things that they were doing with the sound design. In this episode, I definitely did. You know, whether it was the heist that was setting that te- tension in the, the breakdown scene, the heist itself that had a very nice, like, kind of intense strings. There were a couple other ones that were just really well done. There was a scene where she and Tom are riding in a car and there's music playing on the outside and then you go into the car and it's actually the music playing on the radio. Uh, you know, we talked about this before. It's so that diegetic music. The other two scenes that were really phenomenal that told a story with the music. When Issei goes to the reporter and he's about to make his statement, he walks in and the music is upbeat and it's it's loud. He sits down and the music never stops, but it turns down a little bit when he's talking and, you know, they're having their back and forth and it's kind of like a, a repetitive thing. And then as soon as she asks him the, you know, do you give up? Do you not give up? It, like, goes to this slow buildup and it's just this slow, <clears throat> repetitive noise where it's just slowly building this tension until she like stands up and leaves and it drops right as she leaves like she just dropped the biggest truth bomb on him and i thought it was so well done with the music the other one was when they're they're doing the karaoke in in the bar and so lorenzo is singing to miyabi you know it's an i love you song I do think that it was a mistake that they didn't have translation for the song as he was singing. Mm, Yeah, that's a bummer. I think that that could have been really awesome, but that's okay. But basically, as he's singing this I Love You song, and you can feel the the passion of the song, it's building the romantic tension between Camille and Thomas. And there's a part where she's asking him about, like, why he came out here. Why did he make this trip? And as soon as she says, but you're here, it that's when it hits the, the, like the big part of the song. And as soon as he goes and walks out, he gets a call from his partner. And as soon as he walks out, you hear the song again, but it's all muffled. It's just like telling the story that he wants to be with Camille, but he's now with this girl, it's so muffled, and he's not even listening, and he's figuring out that it's truffle. And I just, I, I really, this episode with the sound right. composition, it just was beautiful. I love it. I told you about in the, the first episode how when we first meet Camille in the club, banging music, you know, like great right. tempo. She gets the phone call. She steps outside. Like it gets kind of quieter. She's hearing the bad news and the music like steadies to a single note that sounds like an EKG dropping as he's saying that he's dying. And right. then he wants to rip her from her life after being gone for so long. And it's got her completely pissed off, you know. And so she storms back into the club. And as you can see that anger building, it like picks back up. So to the point that she goes back in the club, it's back to club music. Right. It's, you know, I, I think that this is one of those well done understated soundtracks, which which does oh, a great man. job of helping set the scene in the background. It's not as noticeable and flashy as some other soundtracks. It nails what it is trying to do, whether it's setting the scene or building the tension. I don't think it's necessarily a soundtrack I'm going to listen to outside of this. No. Because I I do feel like this is music that that perfectly sets the scene and, and therefore it doesn't necessarily, without those visuals doesn't necessarily hit on its own yeah i actually listened to the song that they were listening to in the car and it, it's actually a pretty good song I... speaking of um <clears throat> of, of titles of of songs or titles of the show and maybe names i definitely thought it was interesting to find out 
that Camille's second name means drop. Drop. Which did you think about the name of the show? Drops of God. It's like we're in this test that was set up by Alexander, God, you know, and she's the drops of God trying to figure out, and and he's a drop, uh, Issei, because he's a son, he's a drop of God as well. So it's the drops of God trying to beat this test. I do think that they did a really good job with the, the title of the episode, you know, as well, because... there's all these connections and so the title of the episode was duel the duel and we saw like a lot of duels happen here you know we saw thomas's duel with his feelings for camille and what's her name we saw the duel between issei and his dad his dad and his mom the duel the actual duel that we saw i thought that you know it was a very aptly named episode it was. I really like that. And and going back to names for, for just a moment, I, I have another potentially harebrained theory. Maybe I, I'm doing some left fielders, which means I love none it. of them may pay off. I think the, you know, based off a bunch of post-it notes and like things on a desk to think that Issei may have a, a love in his life, maybe a little wild. So Issei, right before the duel, goes into Alexander's office and he sees a picture there and he um, he's looking at it and we see at the end of the episode that he's taken the picture with him. He pulls it out of his jacket while he's driving. Here are my thoughts. Alexander looked very young. Right. Like, like 20 years young. Right. So I think that this is a very old picture. Yes, I agree. So I don't think that Issei is in the picture. I looked and I didn't see Issei. I mean, it, it, to me, it wouldn't make sense based off the age. I mean, maybe, maybe that's just a, a picture of his mentor and that means something to him. But what if one or both of his parents was in that picture? Interesting. Is it possible that the, the the reason that you know there are fights in the alexander household is maybe due to infidelity and is it possible that maybe isei himself could actually be another one of alexander's drops of god i'm these are left fielders they're very wild they could very well be wrong but just so... throwing out some Hairbrained ideas. You think that he could be an actual biological son? Possibly. Or at least have more connection to the family than we thought. Whether it's biological son or... Be, there, You know, there there was something that... I think it was the, the mom or the grandfather said about, you know, wanting to... Oh, so you're just going to go to Alexander? Something like she definitely said his name even though he has passed and i feel like as the mother of a child who's you know has been taught by this person he would she would kind of think of him as like mr ledger right versus that you know like or professor or whatever versus kind of his first name right so it it almost seemed like she might have personal issues with him interesting i but i might just be going out on the limb there well i definitely thought that that picture meant something you know we saw him look at the picture first we saw that he took the picture and i was trying to you know i i agreed i was trying to see if isei was in the picture he's not in it but i do feel like there's so many people in that picture that it did seem more than just a picture of his mentor. So, right. I I think I could get behind these theories. You know, it's hard for me to get behind that he's an actual son of Alexander, 
but it would explain why he is so good at what he does like it's like this gift that is inherited you know genetically so i could and the reporter pointed out that he is the only person that alexander has ever accepted right to personally teach and he's the only one that could ever be camille that was right. another thing she said so i could you know i could see that he is the actual father but then it would kind of make me feel bad because like i i'd like the dad you know the dad loves isei and he's the only one that's backing isei where well, do you, where do you think the father went you see we see him leave at the end you know he gives all his stuff he's shipping oh, it off to yeah to the wife where do you think he's going you think he's just leaving or i have no clue he gave his friggin' wallet yeah now i realize that you know he probably got most of his income from the family business that he married into so maybe that's his way of like really showing i'm out but i don't hopefully he's got some family in town because he's not going to be able to pay for a hotel he's right i i that was wild i did really I like the how big the duel is right like this is like a global phenomenon and i think that that's shown very well through like when they go to the where the lineage grapes are lineage grapes yeah and she's talking to them and he's like do you think it's our wine that's in the contest and you know luca talks about it and this is a huge thing like this is like the biggest story in their their reality right now which i thought was so cool that this just this wine tasting is this epic happenstance that's going on in this world right i mean this is the the largest wine collection in terms of of you know what it's worth in the world right and and it definitely felt like that when they were doing it because once again going back to that musical score it had a ticking clock sound when the tasting first started and that right. just tension up it's like what's what's going to happen when the you know when the timer goes off oh yeah you know it, 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 it feels like you like time is running out you know and once again this is such a mundane thing they are they're both tasting wines, writing some thoughts down, and then seeing if they're right. Right. This sounds like it should be such a boring subject. And damn if they didn't make it so exciting. The you know, when you see Camille just watching Issei as he just blows through it, it's hard yeah. not to watch it because he just, he goes through all the steps and then very confidently writes down. You don't see him going back for a second you don't see him kind of like scrunching his, you know, furrowing right. his brow and thinking about it. He just he knew exactly goes steps, writes down, passes it on, and he knows what the stakes are. Right, right. In, in fact, he might be he might have caused caused his own family to disown him. So to some extent, you could argue the stakes are even higher for him. Right, you know, because if if she fails she goes back to the life she already had. Right. Maybe it's not the best life, but she she does have... Uh, well, maybe she doesn't want to be with her mom at this point. Ugh. The stakes... <laughs> that, they got to go to family therapy for that one. They got to unpack a lot. Also, I do think that that challenge... You know, think about it from Issei's point of view. When he first tastes the wine with her, and, you know, he does it very polished. He looks at the wine, he tastes, he spits... And then when she does it, she tastes, doesn't even look at it, breaks it, storms out. So he's probably expecting like, oh, like, I I've got this. And, you know, after making that decision of, of going through with this and then seeing her actually, you know, go through the steps, do everything, you know, do the taste, do the smell, do, you know, do the look. And then she gets, she's almost got it by just the vintage that would that would scare the crap out of me something that i thought oh, was yeah. a sh sure bet and then all of a sudden she comes out like rambo and like like lucas says she went from i don't drink wine 
to it's uh, uh, 1987 Chateau lineage. Chateau Blanc. <laughs> uh, the yeah. lineage, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure that he saw that when she went through the tasting, that it was clear that this isn't something she does all the time. His was, was so perfect, so, so, you know, so methodical. Right. And you could see hesitation in, in her steps. Like she was like running through a list in her mind of like, right. make sure to do this and then think about it now. Okay. The, okay. This step. And now think about it, you know? So like there was, it didn't look like a professional, but then the fact that her answer was within one vintage of the correct answer. Wild. Wild. Like that's would gotta be, be scary. It's like, if, if, if that's what she can do when she obviously is showing that she hasn't done it that much, what is she going to be able to do by the second test? Right. I do have a question um, real yep. quick. We see that they did the first test, right? We know that there's three tests. Are we going to see all three tests this season? And then what is the next, what would the next season be? If we see all three tests, I don't know. I see. I, I don't know anything about the manga. Me neither. So I don't know if it's limited run and there really isn't more material. I don't know if they're planning on doing more with the the show or not. I don't want anything spoiled, so I specifically have been staying away from it. Same. I'm planning on diving into the the manga after this, just making sure to like. Yeah, I'm, I'm planning on jumping into it after this, okay. but I have no clue. It, I, like, I don't I, know where they can go with this. I was almost thinking, you know, when they first tasted that wine and they were like, you have 30 days to do the second tasting. Like, I thought the first season was just going to be based off that first test, you know, and then each test would have its own season. But I think I think we'll get through all of it this season and then who knows if the story continues from there i'm excited to see i'm very excited to see that i've got one last thing that i want to talk about which is some kind of wine stuff because i thought it was interesting so they they talked about this wine lineage which i thought was really interesting because it's a, a deep cut in in the wine world the story was pretty close to what happened which was you know in the show they talk about the fact that the vine almost went extinct and that you know this was a, a super rare one that he was growing that not a lot of other people were and lineage actually did almost go extinct it did get down to one vine in the entire world wow um and that that vine actually was diseased so they were planning on getting rid of it but they were able to kind of grow it out and and have parts that didn't have disease and then kind of continue growing those parts when you are making wine, just like when you're making, uh, just like when you're growing avocados, apples, anything along those lines, if you want a, you know, like a Hess avocado, you don't put a Hess avocado in the ground. You put part of the plant in the ground and that will, that plant will continue to grow. If you plant something, it'll be a different type of avocado. And it'll be pretty crappy. And it's the same thing with wine, you know, so in this case, that same vine had to go into the ground and eventually propagate and then they take a clipping from that and put that in the ground so it's not like they can take a bunch of grapes from it and just throw those into a field and have you know 30 vines coming from it otherwise they would have 30 different types of grapes right. and they would most likely suck gotcha every single one of them would most likely be terrible there wouldn't be like any good ones most likely Mo most of what comes out of just planting stuff is not good okay wow so so you you generally continue things on that way it's a very tough process to try and pollinate things and and see what comes out and hope to get certain features and and hopefully it's any good you you generally stick with the existing things take a vine cutting, plant that in the ground. But anyway, they, they talked about the, the fact that this grape was unique in that it could make white and red wines. That's incorrect. The, I did like the fact that they were pretty accurate about the, the fact that it almost went out of existence. Yes, red wine is made from red grapes, but what makes it red isn't the juice, it's actually the skin. 
There are extremely few grapes that actually have tinted juice. Most people haven't had those. So most people have had grapes that have had red wine made from grapes where if we get the juice away from the skin very quickly, we will have what looks like white wine. And this is actually, while it's not as it's not in all of these bottles that you think, most people have probably had something like this at some point. If you've had champagne, you most likely have had white wine made from red grapes. The three grapes that you can use in champagne, Chardonnay, which is white, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier, which are red. If it was only made from Chardonnay, it would probably be labeled as Blanc de Blanc. Most people haven't had a ton of Blanc de Blanc, but they have had some kind of champagne. So they probably had Pinot uh, Noir or Pinot Meunier in that. And all they do is press it and get the, the juice away from the skin as, as quickly as possible. Because it's during that oh. time when it's, in, when it's in contact is when it picks up that color. So that was... Now, you don't generally make white wine from red grapes. Champagne is one of the big exceptions. There are some other ones, but that's kind of how you did how you do that. And I, I did want to kind of share that because I thought that was is interesting. Yeah. Did... Okay, so we also... You know, Alex... Alexander talks about that he wants her to get to know him from these wines. I feel like the episode was really focused on the lineage. The, and it seemed like that that was going to be the wine that was telling the story. And then we kind of just did a full U-turn and we're like, it's this one. It's this, this the wine. And, you know, maybe the next episode we're, we'll learn why that wine was special and why he chose that wine. But I I did feel like that I was expecting a more, like as we were talking to that guy that did the linea, the lineage, the, he had some big part in this. And I was a little, I was a little disappointed in that. I I actually also thought that while, while Chateau Cheval Blanc is, is one of the most famous wines in the world and goes for crazy prices. So while that is an extremely well-known wine, I, I thought that Lignage told a much more interesting wine story, you know, that, that really shows the, the difficulty of, of wineries. Uh, the, the wine business is not an easy business, and that's a lot of people do it as a passion because you can see what kind of happens, you know, where they've got this great product. You know that because in the end, somebody is able to hawk it for you know, 10,000 euros a bottle. But because they had such small production, they couldn't get it out to a large audience that would be willing to pay, like that knew that it was quality to be able to pay that price. So in the end, even though they were making something amazing, they couldn't make enough of it to make a name for themselves to be able to sell it for the price that they need to, to pay back their debts. Right. So it's a really, really tough industry. And I think those stories are kind of the more interesting stories than like the deep money Chateau Cheval Blancs that have been around for forever, you know, that probably has a laser sorting table like I talked about last time. Right. It's like, I, I think there there's so many more interesting stories that are kind of Maybe they uh, hopefully don't all end in, in heartbreak like the Lignage one, right. but are, are much more like that where it's like a family working the land, right? You know, rather than you know like billionaires investing. And what, what's that saying in wine? How to make a million dollars with wine to start what, <laughs> with a billion or something like that? Yes, yes, that is a perfect example of of just how how tough the industry is and how how tough it can be to to make any money off of it that's a it's a great and classic joke (laughs) uh and with that i think that that wraps up this episode we have one test down for the duels and drops of god and we will see what the other two have in store for us so join us next week as we take a deep dive into episode four of drops of god i'm mark This is Sterling, and this is The Road Goes Ever On and On. Thanks a lot. Thanks.